The Achaemenid Empire lasted 208 years. The Macedonian Empire of Alexander the Great lasted 231. The Roman Republic lasted 233. Romanov Russia lasted 234. Today, the United States of America is 244 years old. What happens next? Where do we go from here? What do we build out of the ashes? Hello, I'm Kanaz Filan, and these are notes from the end of time. Hello again, everybody, and welcome once again to Notes from the End of Time. We have been away for a while, and of course, things have been exciting in our absence. For those of you who don't know about it, we have had a change of administration. We also have millions of Americans who are convinced that their vote was stolen and that our current president, Joe Biden, is an illegitimate leader. Now, I'm not going to comment on whether or not the election was stolen, but I will say that when millions of people believe that it was, you have a problem on your hands. And I would also add that we have a greater problem here at this point, I would say that a great majority of Americans are not willing to accept the results of an election if their chosen candidate loses. And that is a really big problem because our system of representative democracy only works if everybody involved agrees to accept the results even if their candidate doesn't win. When you don't have that, you are well on your way to a slide where you will have somebody come into power who is a strong, charismatic leader and who will do away with those pesky election problems altogether. We are also still dealing with the fallout from COVID-19, you know, that lockdown that we were supposed to have for a few weeks has extended into going on 10 months now. That has had an enormous financial impact in the United States. We've seen a lot of small businesses closing. What we've actually seen is an enormous wealth transfer from many of those small businesses and small business owners to big box stores and Amazon. And I don't think that was entirely coincidental, but I also think it is a recipe for social unrest. We have had a number of stimulus checks out there. Most of those stimulus checks have gone to hedge funds and large corporations. The Federal Reserve's printing press has been going burr, and that can only end in a collapse of the U.S. dollar and with it the U.S. stock market. This happened in Germany during the Weimar Republic era, so there is precedent for it. And of course, I think we all know what happened after the Weimar Republic. And we're also dealing with an enormous crisis of faith among the millions of people who followed Q, who were part of the QAnon, where we go one, we go all, and they are slowly starting to realize that no savior is coming to rid the swamp of the satanic pedophiles. They're coming to realize that Donald Trump really wasn't playing 4D chess, and Donald Trump never really had a plan with a capital P and frequently doesn't appear to have had a plan with a small p. There's no storm coming, and so you have a lot of very angry and very disillusioned people who still believe, with some justification, let's be fair, that the world is run by a bunch of very wealthy and very evil people, who are involved in things like child trafficking and assassination, and they believe that those people have won. And 
that is, again, yet another bit of tinder in the tinder box. This, we have a very hot situation in hand right now. We've had a four-year, I'd call it a warm war on the streets between the far left and the far right. Mostly the far left has won, but that's not surprising given that the odds were largely stacked against them. Antifa is starting to discover that now that the color revolution is over and now that the regime has been changed, their services are no longer retired, uh, required and many of them have gone from being useful idiots to just plain idiots. And this again means you're going to have that disaffected core fringe on the left if things follow the script that they did after Nixon's resignation, after George Bush was voted out of office by for Bill Clinton, after W was replaced by Obama, if we follow that script, a lot of the people on you know the center left, the sane left, the limousine liberal left, the shit lib left, whatever you want to call it are going to become less interested in politics. In the 70s, people were bombing buildings. They were rioting in the streets. You had a number of terrorist organizations, you know, the Weather Underground, the Symbionese Liberation Army. And these people were getting all kinds of financial and moral support from wealthy liberals, there's a famous famous article by Tom Wolfe about Leonard Bernstein holding a party for the Black Panthers in the 70s. After Nixon was voted, after Nixon resigned, you saw everybody basically sink into this apathy, haze of apathy in Quaaludes and Disco because you can only stay angry and excited so long and so what happened then was the far left became unfashionable. This happens, you see the rise of an anti-war movement during the Bush administration. And you know, when Clinton comes in, we don't stop going to war. We just start seeing a lot less protests about it. Same thing when W is replaced with Obama. And what I expect is that a lot of people who have been cheering on Antifa and putting Antifa stickers on their notebooks or donating money to various far-left causes are going to find other things to do once the COVID-19 lockdown finally ends you're going to start seeing a lot of people who've been starved for companionship and touch. I expect a whole wave of hookup culture to take out, off again. You're going to be seeing people more interested in sex, drugs, and rock and roll than in politics. They no longer have a bad orange man to point to as the face of white supremacy and everything that is evil in the world. So they're you know, don't get me wrong, you're still going to see Antifa marching, you're still going to see people identifying as Antifa, but I think they're going to be unfashionable. They're going to look in 2025 the way somebody wearing love beads and saying, war is not healthy for children and other living things, man, looked in the punk era. I think it's pretty obvious that our leaders are afraid of an insurrection. You don't turn the cap the capital into a green zone with more soldiers than you have in Afghanistan or Iraq if you're not concerned about a revolution. You don't put up guards at state capitals. So I think a lot of people have started thinking about insurrection and social collapse. Some people are fearing it. Some people are cheering it on. My stand, as always, is you know, some of us make history. Most of us just endure it. Whether or not the system is going to collapse, and I expect it will probably sooner rather than later, is really not up to each of us as individuals. All we can do is get ready for the ride. And so how do we do that? Well, 
One thing we've been doing uh, that has actually been another thing keeping me busy is Tom Kaczynski has started a free states project where we are starting to organize people in our respective states for what happens next. You know, how can we organize to blunt the blow? How can we create the community networks that may keep us fed and housed, sheltered and employed at a time when those things become in short supply. And that's us on Telegram. Just go to, if you haven't downloaded Telegram yet, I highly recommend it. Just look for free states and you will find, you know, I'm the admin of free state, New, of free New Jersey, which is our free, we if anybody wants to get rid of bureaucracy, it's us folks in New Jersey. If anybody needs smaller government, it's the people in New Jersey. But we've got 48 others. I don't know if Delaware has come on board yet, but we have the other 49 states are represented there. So come on in and join us. And there's another thing we can do it's as Yogi Berra said, you know, it's difficult to predict anything, especially the future. One thing that we can do to get a better understanding of our current situation is instead of looking into the fog of the future, go back to the past. History may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. If something has happened, Every time a certain set of circumstances has come up, chances are it's going to happen the next time those circumstances come up. You, know, you can look back to history to see how did our ancestors survive famines and plagues? How did they survive social collapse? How did they survive oppression? How did they survive lives under unjust governments? You know, not only how did they conquer these governments but how did they stay around stay alive and keep their culture alive in situations where conquest was not an option because let's be realistic if this comes to insurrection and i expect it's going to there is no guarantee that we will win there's no guarantee of how long it's going to, it will take us. It will not be an overnight process. I've hoped it would go down like, like the Soviet Union, where basically the Soviet Union ran out of money and it ran out of people who were willing to cooperate with the government. And so things fell apart pretty peacefully. I'm afraid at this point it will look more like Yugoslavia. I am expecting that we are going to see conflict. We're not going to see an organized insurgency. What we're going to see is something, again, more like Lebanon or Syria, where you've got a number of different groups you know, banding together on, the, on ethnicity, on religion, on politics. And they're going to be squabbling against each other, and they're probably going to spend more ammo shooting at each other than they are dealing with the ruling forces that oppress everybody. I'm not thrilled about this. I wish things would be different, but that's what I expect. And so I wanted to look back to times when things were tough and there were very few play times that were tougher than the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. And so let's turn our attention to one of the furthest flung, flung provinces of Western Roman Empire. It was an island across from what the Romans called the Mare Britanna, the Sea of Britannia, and what we today call the English Channel. In 44 AD, 10 years or so after the crucifixion, the Emperor Claudius declared Britannia a Roman province. The Romans then spent 40 years trying to subdue it. They managed to subdue the southern half of it, pretty much the area we today call 
England they were able to subdue. And that took brute force. If you know the story of Boudicca, of course, they they made the Romans earn every inch of the, uh, the territory. But once they were able to pacify the territory by force, they went to another Roman technique of pacifying the subjects. It's you build auditoriums, you build roads, you build baths, you bring in trade with the rest of the empire, and this improves the standard of living for the people. And they were pretty successful with that. I mean, Britannia before this had been largely a bit of a hinterland. Now it was integrated in with the rest of the Western Roman Empire through Gaul across the channel. They brought in Roman architecture, some Roman customs. They also imported a lot of gods. I mean, the Romans pretty much rarely found a foreign god that they weren't willing to worship and build temples to. You would find de like shrines in Britain now to deities like Isis. You'd find you know, they had a hot springs that were dedicated to a god to a local god called Sulis. They built a b temple of Minerva Sulis there at Bath. They also brought in later another religious movement that was sweeping the Roman Empire a more controversial one called Christianity. This wasn't all sunshine and roses, of course. There was... Britannia always had a reputation of being a restive province. They had a few small-scale rebellions. A lot of... You know, they, Hadrian had to build a wall famously to keep out the Picts who live in what today is the modern-day Scotland. They had problems across the sea with the Scoti, who were like who were coming in from today's Ireland and being pirates. That would be a problem for centuries to come. And yes, Scotland was occupied by the the Picti and Ireland by the Scoti. It's confusing for you. It was confusing for me when I was writing the manuscript. But anyway, they still things were reasonably good, and they were good for a couple of hundred years. About that 250-year shelf life that I mention in the intro to this podcast, in fact. But the Roman Empire got itself overextended. It became reliant on those extensive trade networks it had built. And the more extensive you make your trade networks... The more fragile your system is. This is something we are coming to learn today. People could have read Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire and figured it out themselves rather than having to experience it. But here we are. And the big takeaway from this is every empire dies sooner or later. And the people who have become accustomed to the conveniences of life under that empire suffer greatly when those conveniences are no longer available. Britain in 410, the Visigoths sacked Rome. And that was just like for the first time there'd been a Rome for 800 years. It was never conquered. These barbarians came in and they tore the place up. And that was a huge blow to the Roman psyche. They, they were having trouble all over the Western Empire, including Britannia. But because their troops were getting stretched thin, they had to withdraw the troops from Britannia. There were no more Roman legions to keep order there. There were no more Roman legions to keep the roads safe. There were no more Roman legions to protect the population from marauders. And writing about a century later, St. Gildas describes the situation. He says, having heard of the departure of our friends, the Romans, and their resolution never to return the Scots and Irish seized with greater boldness than before on 
all the country toward the extreme north as far as the wall. To oppose them, there was placed on the heights a garrison equally slow to fight and ill-adapted to run away, a useless and panic-stricken company who slumbered away days and nights on their unprofitable watch. Meanwhile, the hooked weapons of their enemies were not idle, and our wretched countrymen were dragged from the wall and dashed against the ground. Such premature death, however, painful as it was, saved them from seeing the miserable sufferings of their brothers and children. But why should I say more? They left their cities, abandoned the protection of the wall, and dispersed themselves in flight more desperately than before. The enemy, on the other hand, pursued them with more unrelenting cruelty than before, and butchered our countrymen like sheep, so that their habitations were like those of savage beasts, for they turned their arms upon each other, and for the sake of a little sustenance, imbrued their hands in the blood of their fellow countrymen. Thus foreign calamities were augmented by domestic feuds, so that the whole country was entirely destitute of provisions, save such as could be procured in the chase. And there are a lot of lessons here to be learned which are applicable to our situation. The first one is that when the empire no longer has the money to keep its citizens pacified with bread and circuses or even just with roads and auditoriums, things go south very quickly and I think we are reaching that point. I expect to see a hard economic downturn within the next year or two. And I also believe that the American Empire, like the Roman Empire, is vastly overstretched. Our supply lines are far too long. And all it would take is calamity in a couple of currently peaceful regions to break those supply chains. If things heat up in the South China Sea, for example, in war with China and the Philippines, we might be treaty-bound to go to war with China. And whatever happened there, the first casualty of that would be the supply lines which are bringing the Chinese goods to the United States. And a war with China would also require an awful lot of manpower and resources and every soldier that's fighting in the Pacific theater is a soldier who cannot help maintain order should things start collapsing on the American continent. Russia's involvement in the Great War from 1914 to 1917 certainly played an enormous role in the fall of the Romanov dynasty and the rise of the Soviet Union, we could see a situation like that here. And if we saw a particularly hard economic collapse, you know, combined with a lack of manpower from the American government to maintain order, we would likely see the rise of what they used to call in the Dark Ages war bands, you know, armed motorcycle gangs, organizations like the cartels in Mexico and Central America. We would see those groups coming in, seizing territory, and you know, keeping it not even so much by force of arms as by maintaining law and order. It's like, okay, they're brutal thugs who rob things, but they don't, they keep out the other brutal thugs who rob things, and we've made arrangements to live with them. Because once things start falling apart, people will do anything for that feeling of normalcy for that feeling that things are just business as usual. You see Roman villas in so, what they call sub-Roman Britain, post-Roman Britain, for decades after Rome has pulled out. You still have wealthy people who believe everything is going to be fine. I mean, the more prosperous you are, the more wealthy a neighborhood you're in, the safer you feel, and you can be certain, oh, everything is going to be okay. You know, once the raids start, the first person who stops the raids is going to 
gain a considerable toehold in local power. People will be ready to forgive an awful lot of past sins for the warlord who comes in and once again gets the buses running on time. You're also going to find that your greatest threat may not be the outside invading armies, the war gangs. It may be battles with your neighbors. When people get hungry, they will do anything to feed themselves, and they certainly will do anything to feed their families. We are already starting to see food insecurity rise with the COVID-19 lockdown. We've seen food banks stretch to the limits, doing more business than they've ever done before. If those supply lines break, you are going to start seeing children with malnutrition. You're going to start seeing people dying of preventable diseases. It's likely for a while they're not going to use the words starvation or famine, but just because somebody doesn't call it famine doesn't mean it's not famine. Based on their prior track record, I would expect the social media companies to, at least at first and probably for a good while, start trying to staunch the flow of what they call misinformation through declaring, you know, these reports of famine are exaggerated, you know, these, are, uh, these people are dying of other diseases, or simply suspending the accounts of people who bring out, who talk about this stuff as eyewitnesses. When they were faced with famines that killed tens of millions of people, both the Soviets and the Chinese dismissed all reports of mass starvation as capitalist propaganda. You will still see communists today who will insist that all those reports were overblown and it was nothing more than a bit, one or two years of crop failure. Not that many people died. I expect to see a lot of efforts made to blame the food shortages on other people. If there is an insurrection going, of course, the real villains will be the terrorists who have attacked the supply lines. The real flaw, the real villains will be the officials in the insurrectionist areas who are taking all the food for themselves. There'll even be talk about how all these people that are starving are bad people and deserve it. And I would expect this starvation to happen all across the place, more so in certain areas, if the supply lines break. Cities are going to discover very quickly that flyover country is where all their food comes from. Flyover country is where their electricity power plants are. Flyover country is where a lot of their water treatment centers are. Flyover country has a lot of roads where a lot of their food has to go down to get there. Food will become a weapon in war. There's a time-honored tradition of starving out the enemy. That's the whole point of siege warfare. You can expect to see that come back if you get insurrections. There will be attacks on supply lines from both sides with the intention of causing malnutrition and starvation amongst your enemies. Both sides will justify their own use of this tactic while piteously whimpering about the way it's being used against them. It's always been this way. And chances are it will be that way again. Another thing which I expect as things get bad is that at some point you are going to see America's political class try to maintain power by calling in foreign troops to help quell what they're going to sell as a fascist uprising. There is a very long history of this. One of the defining moments of sub-Roman Britain was in 443, there was a King Wirtgern, he's King of the Britons, he is still being besieged on all sides from armies to the north, having a hard time maintaining power, wrote to Rome yet again, and the Romans at this point 
are fighting with a guy called Attila. You may know him as Attila the Hun. And they absolutely didn't have any more troops to send now than they did when the Visigoths were sacking Rome. So Wurtgern looked to other sources. They sent to the Angles, and the, the Angle, two Angle warlords named Hengest and Horsa, as the 449 Angle, entry of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles says, Hengest and Horsa, invited by Wurtgern, king of the Britons, to his assistance, landed in Britain in a place that is called Ipswin's Fleet, first of all to support the Britons, but they afterwards fought against them. The king directed them to fight against the Picts, and they did so, and obtained the victory wheresoever they came. Then they sent to the Angles, and desired them to send more assistance. They described the worthlessness of the Britons and the richest of the land. They then sent them greater support. Then came the men from three powers of Germany, the Old Saxons, the Angles, and the Jutes. From the Jutes are descended the men of Kent, the Vitvarians, that is, the tribe that now dwelleth in the Isle of Wight, and that kindred in Wessex that men yet call the kindred of the Jutes. From the old Saxons came the people of Essex and Sussex and Wessex. From Anglia, which has ever remained waste between the Jutes and the Saxons, came the East Angles, the Middle Angles, the Mercians, and all of those north of the Humber. And so, once the Angles and Saxons showed up, Britannia's demographic changes dramatically. The main language is no longer Britannic, which is a, a Celtic language. It's similar to Gaelic, to modern-day Welsh, Cornish, and Manx. English is, of course, a Germanic language. Its root is the Old English the dialects which were spoken by the Angles and the Saxons, which developed into the English language, the same way the Frisian language in the Low Country becomes Dutch. Many Britons, including St. Gildas, who I mentioned earlier, migrated to the northeastern coast of France across the Channel. The language which the region they settled in is still called Brittany, the language spoken there, Brechenegg, or as the French call it, Breton, is a close relative of Cornish, so they've preserved a lot of that language and that culture. There was still a Britonic presence in Wales and on the islands I mentioned, but England became largely Anglo-Saxon. The, Ang the Anglo-Saxon rulers had a pretty long series of conquests, put England under what's called the Dane Law, but there was supposedly a one battle where the Britons triumphed against the Saxon oppressors. And Gildas mentioned this. He said it was on Bedon Hill. Now, we're not exactly sure where Bedon Hill is today. Common belief is that Bedon Hill is Salisbury Hill, and Bedon was a word for Bath. There are also other scholars who will tell you that the battle took place in Dorsetshire. There are the ruins of a 5th century fort near the, that area called the Badbury Rings. Liddington Castle in Wiltshire near the hamlet of Badbury has been suggested as the site of the battle. All of these sites, archaeologists have discovered evidence of Roman and post-Roman activity there. So we know there were settlements and there might have been battles there, but we're not sure exactly where it, the Battle of Badon Hill took place. Neither do we know exactly the date. What Gildas said is that the Battle of Badon Hill took place 44 years and one month after the landing of the Saxons, and also the time of my own nativity. And we don't know when St. Gildas was born. We do know he died at a Brittany monastery that he founded on January 9th, 570. If by landing of the Saxons, Gildas met the 449 arrival of Hengist and Horsa and their ships, the Badon Hill battle would have taken place around 493. The problem is when we look at the Anglo-Saxon chronicles, they were compiled in the late 9th century by King Alfred the Great. 
there are a lot of lists of Saxon victories, but the Anglo-Saxon chronicles don't have any statement at all about any great Breton triumph during that time period. There is, however, another source we can look at. It's the Annals Cambriae. They were compiled a little later in the 10th century. That's the Annals of Wales. In the Annals Cambriae, the Battle of Bataan is dated at 516. And there's a different name for the Breton ruler. Gildas said that the per, the rule the Dukes Bellorum, the warlord who led the Britons in the battle against the Saxon troops, was named Ambrosius, that he had been the son of Roman nobles who'd been slain by Saxon invaders. And the Annals Cambriae give this guy a different name. They say the leader was Arthur, who carried the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ for three days and three nights on his shoulders, and the Britons were the victors. We know that by the 5th century, there was a pretty sizable and well-rooted Christian community within Britannia. We know there were persecutions during the Roman era of Christians within Britannia. We know that there were a few martyrs made at that time in, the, in Britain. We know there were a few Romano-British bishops. And we also know that the Bretons' enemies were, by and large, non-Christian. The Scots, the Irish, were non-Christians. The Angles and Saxons who came and took over followed, practiced paganism. And so Christianity became not just a religion, it became an ethnic signifier and what happened to Britannia is something you see throughout the history of Christianity. Nothing really cements Christianity in a culture. Nothing really helps it spread like persecution. When Christians are faced with non-Christian enemies, they often double down on their religious beliefs and frequently, they, in this case, they brought their religious beliefs to their enemies. When the Scoti, when the Irish pirates kidnapped a British third-generation Christian named Patricius, he comes back after escaping from captivity six years later and goes on to become a guy we know best as St. Patrick. St. Columba goes up to minister to the Picts, and he converts Scotland in the 6th century. Wales, the 7th century, was the Age of Saints. There were monasteries built all over Wales, and within a few generations of conquering England, many of the Angles and Saxons had, had moved away from paganism and become Christians themselves. In the Eastern Roman Empire at this time, what we call Byzantium, the Byzantine Empire, that is now the center of Christendom, the center of Christianity. And uh, there was a nostalgia at this time in Britannia, in Europe, for the old Roman Empire, which was Christianized not long before it fell. This is so... Europe, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Constantine ended the persecutions and made it the state religion. Theodosius in 395 had gone on to ban pagan practices. And so people in the 5th and 6th century identified Christianity with the Roman Empire, with that strong, stable empire that they remembered. And that was a big draw to people living in an age of chaos. And this big draw is something that leads me to expect we are going to see a rise in Christianity in the United States in the face of a collapse 
and as happened in Britannia, in post-Roman Britain, I expect that we're going to see a lot of the sent the networks which develop to rebuild society, the people who are rebuilding the society and the defenders of society to come out of the Christian churches. I've expected this revival for some time. It's one reason that I, like Ambrosius or Arthur, if you prefer, have placed the cross on my own shield and have chosen to carry it into battle. I believe that Christianity was the fire which helped forge modern-day Europe. It certainly helped forge the modern-day English identity and the modern-day European identity, and it's an instrumental part of the Arthurian legend which, just, which arose out of the chaos of post-Roman Britain. I expect that this is going to happen again with us. I know right now, American Christians feel increasingly beleaguered by a society which they see as openly hostile. And I'm sure I'm going to get comments from people laughing about Christians aren't persecuted. I'll probably get a few comments about sky daddies and how we've grown past the need for all that. But the fact remains that we have faced some great challenges before, and there have been many people who have counted Christianity out. As I men I've mentioned before on this show, there have been people who have been at war with God for 200 years, and I'm betting on God. I believe there's a religious impulse which is hardwired into us, we have a need for ritual. We have a need for religion. Take away the religion and we find other ways to exercise that religious impulse. I don't think it is at all a coincidence that wokeness functions like a religion complete with enemies, dogmas, rituals of expiation. I don't think it's at all a coincidence that the QAnon movement largely functioned like a religion, complete with the secret messages and the people banding together to fight against a shadowy, ill-defined evil force. From my vantage point, the secular religious movements which have arisen contain all the flaws that we commonly associate with Christianity and very few of the virtues. If I'm going to build a new society out of the ashes of the old, I would much prefer a blueprint which has been time-tested for 2,000 years and counting. What we call Western civilization has been a Christian civilization pretty much since its inception. France becomes France thanks to Charles the Hammer driving off the Muslims at the Battle of Tours. Spain is Spain because it retained that identity nearly 800 years of Muslim occupation. A Christian identity can sustain us as a people in triumph and it can also sustain us in defeat. When you take a look at the beginnings of the Arthurian legend, you can see how one winning battle amidst a long series of defeats was transformed into the seminal legend of English culture. If a war starts, we will be facing powerful, well-armed, and wealthy enemies. If China gets involved, and there's a pretty good chance China will get involved, China is constantly short of food. The breadbasket of America, we produce so much food that we destroy it to keep prices from sinking too low. So the Chinese want access to that breadbasket if they are invited in and that has happened so many times, as I'd mentioned before, Vortigern in, imports in the Saxons, the Romans before him, 
were using the Germanic tribes as mercenaries, and those same Germanic tribes later sacked Rome twice and, in fact, ended the Western Roman Empire in 476. The Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantines, constantly relied on mercenaries, and they even brought in a group called the Seljuk Turks because, you know, what are they going to do? They're a bunch of horse-riding nomads. It's not like they're ever going to form an organized front against us and set up like an Ottoman Empire, you know? There's a non-trivial chance that we will be fighting a war not only against our own people, but foreign troops brought in as mercenaries. Once those troops are brought in, there is a very good chance that we will lose control of much of our country to foreign forces. The only thing, well, there's a couple things that keep people from getting, from invading America. One of them is our position. You have to go across a couple of big oceans, and there's only a few con- countries in the United, in the world right now with a full blue water navy, and the United States is one of them. And last I checked, China was working toward that. They're not there yet. There's also the pesky little problem of our nuclear weapons. Both of those obstacles could be overcome simply by having the United States powers in force invite in the invaders. And I think if push comes to shove, they will invite the invaders. So there's a chance, there's a good chance, maybe a better chance that the chance that it will happen than not, that we are going to see foreign occupation. And let's be honest here, there's a good chance that we will be defeated. I'm not saying that to be pessimistic or depressing. I'm being honest. This is a very real fight. There's no guarantee we will win that fight. But here's the thing. We can lose a fight. We can lose a battle. And we can retain our identity as a people. We can retain our identity as Christians. We can retain our identity as Americans, as what America should be, not what it has become. We can rebuild from that. Maybe we'll rebuild as a subjugated people. Maybe we'll have to rebuild in secret. But we can rebuild. 1,500 years after the Battle of Bedon Hill, Vortigern is still remembered as a traitor. King Arthur and his men are still remembered as heroes. What will they say of us 1,500 years from now? What side do you want to be on? We may lose everything. Most of the knights who set off in quest of the Holy Grail never saw it, and many of them died along the way. But despite all that, it's better to die in pursuit of a good cause. It is better to lose everything in pursuit of a good cause than it is to hold on to what you have by acquiescing to a bad cause. Like Arthur, I will bear the cross on my shield. Like Arthur, I will fight against overwhelming odds. If it be God's will, I will triumph. If it be God's will, I will be defeated. I will keep the spark burning for as long as I can, and I will pass it down to those who will hold it. I will tread the path that better men than me trod upon long before, and I will keep in mind the words that Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote in his Idols of the King. I, Galahad, saw the grail, the holy grail, descend upon the shrine. I saw the fiery face as of a child that smote itself into the bread and went, and hither I am come. And never yet hath what thy sister taught me first to see this holy thing failed from my side, nor come covered, but moving with me night and day, fainter by day, but always in the night, blood red and sliding down the blackened marsh, blood red and on the naked mountain top, blood red and in the sleeping mere below, blood red, and in the strength of this I rode, shattering all evil customs everywhere, and passed through pagan realms, and made them mine, and clashed with pagan hordes, and bore them down, and broke through all, and in the strength of this come victor. 
But my time is hard at hand, and hence I go, and one will crown me king far in the spiritual city, and come thou too, for thou shalt see the vision when I go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, this has been Notes from the End of Time, Episode 18. Thank you very much for listening. Kanaz Filan here, and may God bless us, each and every one.